Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to uh, today's multimodality imaging conference. And uh, today I'm very pleased to have with me Dr. Suman Chang and Dr. Mawaz Almala. And what we're going to try to do today is uh, just go through a little overview of what's new, what's come out in the last academic year uh, with regard to cardiac MRI, cardiac CT, and cardiac PET. And uh, before we get started, uh, for those of you that are watching us uh, via uh, Facebook, live stream, or YouTube, if you have any questions, and we will have some time for questions at the end, please text DEBAKEY, D-E-B-A-K-E-Y, to the number 37607, or go to pollev.com and slash DEBAKEY. Um, and, and those uh, instructions are on the screen as well. For those of you that are at Houston Methodist uh, within our network, um, you'll have the opportunity if you just raise your hand, uh, we can actually uh, beam you right in uh, and you can ask us a question live uh, and we'll ask you to put your camera on when you do that. So let me go ahead and get started. And uh, so what I'm going to try to do, um, you know, I think we've seen significant advances in imaging over the last year, over this academic year. I'm going to try to just highlight a few of the recent publications that have come out. Uh, and here's kind of an outline. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about some stress perfusion CMR, uh, talk about some recent data with regard to CMR for cardiac amyloid, uh, again, highlight some additional prognostic data that's come out with extracellular volume mapping, uh, and then uh, talk a little bit about a newer technique that most of us may not be that familiar with, which is diffusion tensor imaging of the heart. So let me just jump right in. Um, so uh, there was a publication in New England Journal within this last academic year, which I think was really uh, a very high quality publication, uh, which was called the MR Informed Study. And this was a multi-center uh, international clinical effectiveness randomization trial. And the, the basic hypothesis for this trial was that guiding initial management of patients with stable angina and intermediate to high risk coronary artery disease receiving optimal medical therapy by use of MR perfusion imaging would be non-inferior to invasive coronary angiography supported by FFR. And these are the inclusion criteria. Uh, they looked at basically patients with stable angina, class uh, two or three, who had uh, some risk factor, so at least two uh, of the following risk factors, smoking, diabetes, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, uh, or a positive family history uh, as well, uh, or the patients could have been enrolled in the absence of risk factors if they had a positive exercise treadmill stress test. Uh, and the primary endpoint here for this study was all-cause mortality, non-fatal myocardial infarction, or target vessel revascularization. And here's kind of the, the schematic for the trial. So they, uh, they enrolled and randomized close to 1,000 patients of which about half underwent uh, invasive coronary angiography with FFR, and about half underwent uh, cardiovascular MRI as the index test. And then, uh, based on cardiovascular MRI findings, uh, patients with abnormalities were then referred on to undergo invasive coronary angiography. And a couple of things that were noted here, which is that uh, FFR uh, uh, was performed um, in about 61% of the patients that were randomized to the invasive group uh, and about 49% of the patients that were randomized to the CMR group based again on an abnormality on CMR. And then ultimate revascularization uh, occurred in 36% of the total cohort in the CMR group compared to 43% of the total cohort in the group that went directly to invasive angiography. And I think despite the fact that there was a lower rate of uh, vessel revascularization in the MRI-guided strategy, uh, outcomes was similar uh, across the follow-up uh, period uh, for both the group that underwent a cardiovascular MRI strategy or the group that underwent a direct invasive uh, strategy. And so I think the uh, Eichel Nagel, who is the lead author, and the uh, other authors concluded that uh, myocardial perfusion CMR was associated with a lower incidence of coronary revascularization than an FFR approach, uh, and, however, it was not inferior to FFR, uh, 
with, with respect to major adverse cardiovascular events. So again, I think this just adds to the compendium of literature uh, that's out there with stress MRI. And I think I'm sure that Sumin and, and uh, Mawaz will also highlight uh, some of the other data that's out there with other imaging modalities as well when it comes to management of patients with coronary artery disease. Now, one of the questions or comments I always get is, you know, whenever we look at stress perfusion MRI, does it take an expert to be able to uh, do this interpretation? Because you're looking really at dynamic images. Um, and so uh, a group uh, out in England actually tried to say, what if we um, utilize a technique uh, which, again, uses the advent of uh, computer uh, hardware and software uh, to allow uh, basically an automated pixel-wise quantitative perfusion CMR map. So instead of looking at that dynamic image that I showed you, uh, and again, the, the methodology, I don't want to get into the specific details, it was published on by Peter Kelman a couple years ago, but essentially it's, it's taking the raw uh, stress perfusion data, uh, undergoing an automated processing algorithm uh, to then produce essentially a pixel by pixel map uh, let's get the, uh, to, to produce a pixel by pixel map uh, of uh, myocardial blood flow, both at stress and rest. Uh, and this is just an example of one of the images uh, from that publication, uh, showing in fact, as we can see on the stress for perfusion MR raw data, you can see that there appears to be a perfusion abnormality here in the LED distribution. We can see it in the septum extending to the anterior wall. And the automated perfusion maps also show an abnormality in this area as well. And, and this, uh, these automated perfusion maps actually allow you to quantify the blood flow uh, within the myocardium within any given region or even pixel by pixel. Um, and when this was applied then to a cohort of patients uh, with stable angina as intermixed with some healthy volunteers, uh, what they found was that there was actually a pretty good relationship between uh, FFR findings and abnormalities on the automated uh, pixel by pixel stress perfusion MRI map uh, such that uh, the MRI was, was fairly good at distinguishing those patients that were going to be FFR normal with an FFR greater than 0.8 versus those patients with an FFR abnormal, i.e. an FFR less than 0.8. Um, and so that's a technique that, that I hope we'll see uh, roll out into the mainstream uh, to multiple CMR centers uh, over the next few years because again I think uh, it really provides some very robust information. So let's move on to cardiac amyloid and obviously I think we've seen a resurgence of interest in cardiac amyloid in the last few years as there's now some uh, therapies that are available for these patients and so what can CMR help with? So obviously you know we've known for quite some time that our delayed enhancements uh, CMR technique, or late gallium enhancement, as we often call it, uh, is very good for identifying uh, structural abnormalities in patients with uh, cardiac amyloidosis. And the classic uh, hallmark finding is that you, you see uh, extensive hyperenhancement or late gallium enhancement within the myocardium uh, in patients with uh, cardiac amyloid infiltration. And again, the bottom schematic here shows the the underlying pathophysiologic mechanism by which this occurs. And it really has to do with the kinetics of gadolinium, which is that in normal myocytes, where there's very little in the way of space between myocytes, the extracellular volume is very limited. There's uh, limited room or volume of distribution for gadolinium, and therefore uh, very minimal uh, gadolinium uptake by normal myocardium. Whereas in patients who have extensive amyloid deposition, this protein then leads to uh, an increase in the extracellular space, which again is where gadolinium contrast agents tend to go in the equilibrium phase. And as a result, with there being an increase in the amount of gadolinium, when we do our delayed enhancement imaging, we see areas of high signal. So let me move on now to this particular study, which said, you know, this technique is great for people that we can give gadolinium contrast agents to, but what about patients that were concerned about giving gadolinium contrast agents, you know, specifically you know, referring to those with end-stage uh, kidney disease. And so the idea here was to say, can we use some of these new T1 mapping techniques without contrast to try to just pixel by pixel measure what is the T1 relaxation time of the myocardium uh, 
And can that be useful in actually identifying patients uh, that could have uh, cardiac amyloidosis? And so this was uh, out of a group uh, in, in the UK, and they looked at a series of patients that had suspected cardiac amyloidosis and performed a non-contrast CMR. So this is basically uh, what we call our T1 mapping technique, which is shown here on the right-hand side, where each pixel is encoded based on what the T1 time of the tissue within that pixel is. And what they found, and they proposed this algorithm right here, which is that patients that had, and again, this is data now at one and a half Tesla, uh, patients that had a native T1 time that was greater than 1164, which represented really a Z-score of 3.5, so 3.5 standard deviations above the, the mean for their uh, normal uh, volunteers, that there was a high likelihood that these patients would have cardiac amyloidosis. And on the flip side, for patients that had a normal myocardial T1 time, a native T1 time of less than 1,036, representing a Z-score of less than 0 0.4, that most of these patients had no evidence of cardiac amyloid involvement. And then there was a gray zone or a border zone, which is those with a T1 value between 1036 and 1164, where they said those are patients, obviously, that uh, there's uncertainty and, and you'd need further, whether it's with administration of gadolinium contrast or in patients that you can't give gadolinium contrast, maybe proceed on to biopsy or something. Uh, and, and what they found is that using this approach, there's actually a fairly good uh, area underneath the curve for uh, identifying uh, or excluding uh, cardiac, cardiac amyloidosis. And so, again, I think that we'll see... Uh, this continue to uh, uh, become more widespread. And I think, again, this can be a gatekeeper now for patients that were concerned about cardiac amyloid, but that we have some hesitation in giving gadolinium contrast agents to. Now, let me turn on to uh, kind of further data with regard to T1 mapping and specifically extracellular volume uh, uh, assessment. Uh, and this was a publication uh, late last year from uh, one of uh, our colleagues here, Eric Ying, who looked at a large cohort of patients, uh, over 1,200, who had presented uh, for cardiovascular MRI imaging. And all of these patients underwent the standard delayed enhancement MRI to identify uh, evidence of replacement myocardial scar, and then also underwent T1 mapping before and after gadolinium contrast to quantify the extracellular volume globally. So this is a global ECV measure. and. Uh, really, it showed that those patients with an elevated ECV, and, and in our lab, uh, we consider to be outside of the two standard deviation mark of a, of a cohort of normal volunteers, is 30 percent. Uh, and this uh, study very nicely showed that patients who had a normal ECV had a much better prognosis than patients who had an elevated ECV. And I think one of the unique findings was that this uh, held true both for patients that had evidence of any replacement scar by delayed enhancement MRI, as well as patients that had no evidence of replacement scar by delayed enhancement MRI. And again, I think the, the other unique feature of this study was that the ECV measurements were all done in this series, uh, excluding any areas of late gallium enhancement, whether it be ischemic pattern or non-ischemic pattern LGE. So, and then uh, another study that also came out from our lab was uh, following up on patients with mitral valve prolapse. And one of the things that we'd shown previously was that patients with mitral valve prolapse seem to get uh, a, a, or have a higher prevalence of developing scar within the myocardium, and it seems to be localized around the posterior medial uh, papillary muscle. And so that's replacement fibrosis. What about uh, extracellular volume expansion, which is, again, a surrogate for interstitial fibrosis? Do these patients with mitral valve prolapse, do they also have that? And is it unique to mitral valve prolapse? Or is it simply something that occurs irrespective of whether it's mitral valve prolapse or primary MR due to other etiologies? And what we found was that the, the rate of ECV elevation was similar across both patients with mitral valve prolapse uh, as well as patients with primary MR due to another etiology, but that it was related to severity of mitral regurgitation. Um, but I think probably most uh, you know, interestingly, was that uh, if, when we looked at asymptomatic primary MR patients, we found is that those who had an elevated ECV actually had a much greater likelihood of decompensation over the follow-up period versus those 
who had a normal ECB despite having significant mitral regurgitation, here defined as, as 3 plus or 4 plus. And let me just wrap up here uh, with uh, kind of one uh, new MRI technique that I think most people may not be that familiar with. And, and in fact, you know, I call it new because I think it's new to the cardiac world, but the neuroimagers have been using these diffusion tensor MRI imaging techniques for some time. And, and it's basically a way to look for diffusion of water molecules. And the basic principle is that if water uh, motion is completely uninhibited, then you're going to have very random uh, diffusion of water. And as a result, then the, the, the measure that's uh, computed, which is called anisotropy, would be zero. Essentially, uh, molecules just float in any free direction possible. Whereas if you have perfectly uh, uh, complete myocardial array uh, with all cell, membra cell membranes intact, which really restrict movement of water, then you're going to have anisotropy scores that are higher than zero. And so uh, this is a group of uh, investigators that applied this to a series of patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy to try to see, one, can this technique work in this patient population in the heart? And then I think, uh, and these are just some example images that they show of the fractional anisotropy map uh, amongst normal healthy controls, uh, a young Holcomb patient, as well as some older Holcomb patients who had evidence of ventricular uh, arrhythmias. And what they find is that clearly there's uh, more anisotropy that's evident in patients who have uh, more ventricular arrhythmias and more advanced uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy compared to the normal healthy controls. And in a small pilot study, when they looked at a series of 50 patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and stratified them based on whether or not they had ventricular arrhythmias, they found, in fact, that the anisotropy score was lower, again, closer to zero, uh, uh, indicative of myocardial disarray in the patients who had ventricular arrhythmias versus those with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy without evidence of ventricular arrhythmias. So I think to kind of wrap up in these last 15 minutes, you know, what, is, what have we learned uh, in the last year uh, with regard to CMR? I think one is there continues to be advances in stress perfusion CMR imaging. And I think a, an exciting area is the ability to do automated pixel-wise uh, quantification of myocardial blood flow. Uh, that I think with cardiac amyloid, uh, we've already had robust techniques with late gallium enhancement that identify uh, amyloid infiltration in patients who have, uh, uh, or who are given gadolinium contrast agents. But now there may be ways with non-contrast techniques that we can uh, help stratify the likelihood of having amyloid involvement. Uh, again, there continues to be more and more prognostic data with regard to extracellular volume uh, and its association with uh, adverse clinical outcomes. And then lastly, I think this new uh, or newer technology, uh, diffusion tensor imaging, which really allows us to look at myocardial fiber array and disarray, uh, I think is going to be very exciting as well. So let me uh, say that this, again, is really just the tip of the iceberg. And I think that there's many more advances that have occurred in the last year. And I think many more advances uh, that are still to come within CMR. So now uh, I want to turn it over to Sumin Chang, who's the Associate Director of Cardiac CT. And he's going to give us an update of what's uh, new in cardiac CT in the last year. Zoom in. Thank you, Stephen. Um, this is kind of overview of what I'm going to uh, mention in this uh, um, talk. Uh, I'm going to talk about current CTA, some data and clinical outcome, update and guideline, and pushing the envelope for the role of current CTA in patients with different um, manifestations of coronary disease. I briefly talk about what new hardware came out this last year, and mention briefly the expanding role of, of CT for structural heart intervention, and some future application of CT, and what's the role of CT in current COVID-19 pandemic. I think one of the most important uh, development in, for the last year is the 2019 European Society of Cardiology guideline for the diagnosis and management of coronary disease. Essentially, now CTA is considered class 1 indication in patients with suspected coronary disease, especially in patients with low clinical likelihood. And if you work in a center with scanner that you can obtain high image quality 
I think CTA is a preferred test even for intermediate risk patients. And this is the result of multiple clinical trials that have been done for the last five, ten years, which essentially validated the role of CT. And I think what clinched it is the publication of Scott Hart trial published in New England Journal of Medicine over a year ago, which for the first time showing in a randomized setting, performing CTA as the first test of diagnostic test compared to standard care, most of them stress ECG, can lead to improvement of clinical outcome. The initial study published in Lancet was only follow up to about two years and show some reduction of non-fatal myocardial infarction but wasn't statistically significant. And this post hoc analysis, but predefined analysis at five years showed there was a significant reduction of non-fatal myocardial infarction in the group of the which patient was managed with CTA compared to standard care. And that's true across all different types, different subgroup of patients. The, the authors subsequently performed a quite detailed analysis about the potential mechanism and um, um, improvement of uh, the outcome and shows that patient who was allocated to coronary CTA does have higher, undergo more frequently coronary uh, invasive angiogram and revascularization in the first year of the presentation, but, there, uh, but the frequency of intervention or PCI in standard care group caught up after four or five years. And the most important finding, I think, is they showed that there was increase in the utilization of appropriate management, pharmacological management, such as antiplatelet therapy and starting therapy. There's always, there's obviously some other biased um, reason, such as if patient was shown to have coronary disease and CTA, more likely uh, they, the physician will pay more attention. Uh, I think this is still uh, controversial in the sense of what exactly uh, CTA strategy leads to improvement of, of outcome, but uh, I think the guideline here in the U.S. would change um, following the European uh, guideline. So what we talk about so far, the role of CT has been limited in patients with stable coronary disease. Uh, with chest pain. For the last two year, for last year, there were two publications in Jack um, exploring the role of coronary CTA in patients presenting with non ST elevation MI. And I think this is a very interesting study. This is a relatively small study uh, done in Europe, in which they randomized um, over 200 patients presenting with chest pain and positive troponin. So by all definition of non-estilation in mind into routine invasive angiography first versus CTA first versus CMR first. So the primary endpoint they look at was um, presence of coronary disease and the and the present and the incidence of referrals to the subsequent invasive angiogram, exploring the role of CTA and CMR in gatekeeping as a gatekeeper for performing invasive angiogram. Since we know from multiple prior study uh, that up to one third of patients presenting with non in MI does not have significant stenosis in subsequent invasive angiogram. So uh, you can see there, 100% uh, of the patient who was assigned to routine clinical care underwent co uh, invasive angiogram. Uh, 80, around 80% of the, 85% of, um, 87% uh, 80, 80, of patients who was assigned to CMR uh, eventually end up having invasive angiogram and only 60, around 65% uh, uh, of the patient who underwent CTA first, ended up having um, invasive angiogram. And there was the 
the outcome in terms of um, subsequent cardiac death, uh, complication, non-fatal MI, hospitalization, or no different across all group, um, meaning that the strategy of doing a CMR first or CCA first in, instead of invasive angiogram is clinically safe. And other important finding that uh, in patients who underwent invasive angiogram or CCA, quite a few of them end up having CMR, especially when no significant coronary disease was found. In those patients, CMR was pro able to provide new diagnosis in about 33% of the patient. Most of them are uh, related to myocarditis or true uh, ischemic uh, myocardial infarction, uh, likely due to spasm or, uh, or, or uh, embolic event. And obviously, this is a relatively small study and um, showing that the diagnos diagnostic strategy incorporating CMR or CTA first uh, could be um, uh, safe, and, uh, and this will uh, justify uh, to be confirmed in our larger clinical trial. The second paper that was just published earlier this year was done in Denmark. It was a large uh, study um, essentially exploring a different treatment strategy, invasive versus conservative strategy in patients presenting with acute coronary syndrome, non elevation MI. And as a part of this study, every, sing every patient in this study, which is called Verdict, done in Denmark, has a CTA. So out of 2,150 patients of the clinical, uh, of the main study, over 1,000 patients had CTA. And most of the reason the CTA will not perform in those patients uh, either because uh, was either canceled by the treating physician or because uh, the randomized uh, time for all of the routine clinical operation or cardiac CT. As you can see, was clinical feasible in patients who presenting in the daytime do a coronary CTA before patient going on invasive angiogram. As a matter of fact, the average time from the patient reached the ED and the patient getting the CTA was about two, two and a half hours. So over this, over a thousand patients, they compared the finding of the coronary CTA with the invasive angiogram. And this is the diagnostic accuracy study. Why is this important? Most of the study that was reported before was done in stable patients with relatively low prevalence of significant obstructive disease, range from about 5% to 15%. And uh, we all know that CTA had, uh, coronary CTA had a very good negative predictive value, and people have always argued that the test might not perform as well in a higher prevalence, in a population with higher prevalence of disease. In this study, over 60% of the patients have 50% or more stenosis in one of the major epicardial uh, arteries. As you can see here, the diagnostic accuracy did not change from study done in stable patients, such as, for instance, negative predictive, predictive value of 91%, and that is not different in group of patients who had early CTA, meaning uh, uh, within three hours of presentation to the ED, or patient with history of acute myocardial infarction, history of PCI, high grade score. So this is an old common study that did not exclude any patient without, with history of disease or stenting. So I think this um, study would uh, encourage us to do a larger clinical trial to see the safety and uh, efficacy. So what are the new cardiovascular CT technology? Uh, so right now, most, uh, until this moment, most of the cardiac CT uh, was done in the hospital-based uh, setting, where now the two companies, both GE and Siemens, had uh, commercialized and scanner that could be placed in the office setting, such a, uh, such a small area as 15 square meters. And this is, despite being a small footprint, 
they are right quite powerful and can pretty much uh, perform uh, most, uh, I would say 95% of the routine clinical study we use. How does this affect how we manage disease remains to be seen? Other interesting finding that there was some finally breakthrough in terms of uh, spatial resolution of CT, which already is among the highest in all the non-invasive imaging, but still not quite as uh, good as invasive angiogram. Uh, Channon has this aculon precision. Essentially, uh, you can see that the sector channel has been reduced to 0.25 millimeter thickness with a theoretical uh, spatial resolution about 0.2 millimeter, quite close to um, invasive angiogram. Uh, as you can see there, um, let's say the difference between the conventional scanner and this new high precision scanner is the difference between the 4K uh, TV and versus the uh, 1080 uh, pixel. And this is some of the example uh, I think will be very useful in the patient with heart rate under control, especially uh, improved uh, assessment of calcific lesion or patient with uh, uh, scent. It's not, a new, it's, it's not new that we know the CT is essential for uh, planning uh, structural heart intervention, especially in the realm of TAVAR, and, and also right now with uh, mitral valve uh, and tricuspid valve intervention. Uh, what's new that, um, that there is a new guideline from the Society of uh, Cardiovascular CT in, in establishing the technique and the requirement. This is a quite uh, a technical paper that uh, can be found in the website. I think for all everybody who's interested in doing a CT in the structural heart, it's a must-read document. Um, the other thing that I think was uh, very uh, intriguing is uh, CT data set could be also used for interprocedural uh, guidance, uh, such as this paper uh, that published from our lab showing the CT fusion imaging in guiding transcatheter paravalvular lead closure could be associated with improvement, uh, excuse me, reduction of procedural time and also a reduction in the fluoroscopy time and contrast usage. Uh, what's not very well established yet, but uh, it's about the, uh, the role of um, CT for post-procedural follow-up. Uh, however, over the least last year, there have been two in, uh, interesting papers published uh, regarding this uh, so-called um, uh, thrombosis, eight subclinical thrombosis of the leaflet. A uh, uh, study from Galileo shows that anticoagulation is effective in getting rid of those thrombosis, but at expense of higher risk of bleeding. And this multi-center study called Ocean Tavi registered from Japan show that uh, about 10%, 10 to 15% of the patient could have uh, late thr uh, thrombosis of the leaflet after TAVAR, but some of them could develop uh, up to three years later, and some of them even um, resolve spontaneously and show up in different leaflet. But important finding was there was no significant uh, impact in clinical outcome. But we're going to see a lot more in the future about using CT to follow uh, this new um, or this new newer uh, structural heart intervention. And just a, um, um, a brief view of what the future of CTA. Um, this is a state of our review published in, um, in Jack. And I think it, for everyone who is interested in doing CT, it's, uh, it's, it's very, it's very it's, uh, for me at least, it's very entertaining. Uh, it essentially talk about all the advances of the hardware and the uh, uh, analytic software, who well, I think potentially will propel even further uh, the utili uh, utility of CT in management of the diagnosis, both diagnosis and treatment and follow-up of disease, specifically uh, using, uh, for instance, computational flow dynamic to look at shear stress of the coronary vessels. Um, uh, it also can improve hemodynamic uh, assessment of lesion. One of the intriguing concepts is the delta difference of CTFFR before and after a, um, uh, I'm sorry, upstream and downstream from a lesion 
it could be a much better predictor outcome than just CCFFR alone. Um, other improvement could be radiomic, which could extract a lot of information that human eyes cannot see. And also assessment, uh, quantification of, of myocardial function, structural heart intervention, congenital heart intervention, and using advanced quantification of CT data set using artificial intelligence or machine learning could improve further uh, the predictive value of the coronary CTA. However, uh, in the current uh, pandemic era, I think CT even have an even major role. Uh, this ESC guidance for the diagnosis and management of CV disease in, place in this pandemic. The CT should be the, pre the preferred non-invasive imaging modality to diagnose CAD because it really reduces time exposure of the patient and the personnel in the lab. And, um, and they think cardiac CT would be maybe preferred to TE to rule out left atrial thrombus and cardiac thrombus before the cardioversion. And however, uh, we need to be aware that uh, CT can, should be only performed in patients that the finding would uh, uh, change the management and make an impact in patients uh, and outcome. And I, again, in summary, uh, there's been quite a few uh, new development of cardiac CT for the list last year. I think CT is no longer a new technology, it's mature, and I think never in uh, history of non-invasive imaging, we have amassed such a large amount of clinical data in such a short period of time, and really it should be part of our everyday uh, practice and what we have to do is use it judicially to uh, be efficient and effective. Thank you. Malas, Thank give you. us an update on cardiac PET. All right, so we're going to discuss advances in cardiac PET uh, over the past year. So with cardiac PET, it's a technology now that it's always thought to be used in myocardial perfusion imaging, but there are many other applications of cardiac PET, including viability imaging, imaging of cardiomyopathy, and then looking at endocarditis and other infections. In the coming few minutes, I don't have time to cover all advances, so I'll just focus on a couple things on the perfusion imaging and cardiomyopathies. So for myocardial perfusion imaging, we've been using SPECT all through long time, and we have wealth of data on its additive diagnostic and prognostic value. And however, the image quality sometimes, especially with the increased epidemic of obesity and other uh, metabolic syndromes, uh, may not be the best. And here's the same patient that uh, was imaged in our lab within a few days. This is the SPECT imaging and this is the PET imaging. Uh, you can see the differences in image quality and certainty of interpretation of PET versus SPECT that you see among these two patients. And this was reflected in a recent publication from the Pacific Trial. And just a reminder, the Pacific Trial enrolled 208 patients who underwent both SPECT, PET, CT, CTFFR, and finally diagnostic angiography and invasive FFR. And when they looked at their data and looked at the comparison for com uh, using gold standard as, CT, uh, as uh, invasive FFR, SPECT had an AUC of 0.75. PET has an AUC of 0.91, and this is only when they studied the patient that they could do CTFFR on. So the study included 208 patients, but they only s included in this analysis to 157 uh, patients. So PET was almost equal in this selected subgroup in these patients. But if you look at an intention to diagnose analysis, clearly PET is the winner here and the most diagnostic test uh, uh, in terms of accuracy if you compare it to other imaging modalities with an intention to diagnose analysis. And there are many reasons for this uh, the enhanced diagnostic accuracy of cardiac PET. Part of it is advances that we see in technology now. Now we have digital PET, which now come from all three vendors and allows you to be able to acquire excellent image quality with uh, smaller doses in um, uh, radio tracer injected. Uh, 
and also we do multi-parametric assessment we look at perfusion we look at ejection fraction we look at calcium score and we also look at uh, myocardial perfusion imaging uh, we look at the myocardial blood flow which allows us for excellent assessment of coronary flow reserve and microvascular function and this is for example a patient that you see has a defect in the anterolateral wall which appears to be and uh, the apex and distal anterior wall suggesting that this might be a one vessel disease and we'll see later what is the final diagnosis on this patient but how are practices using PET and SPEC this is a nice study that came out last year from the Mid-America Heart Institute group in okay. Kansas City who have been using now cardiac PET for almost like 17 years or so and they have a database of 156,000 patients who had, uh, sorry, studies which had 30% of them PET and 70% of them SPEC. And this is the data till 2017. When you look at the temporal trends, so when they started with that in 20, 2003, they were doing about 20% of their studies about with PET and SPEC. So there was an overall trend downward, which was seen globally in the country, uh, sorry, in the country with, in terms of utilization of myocardial perfusion imaging. But the percent with PET was almost steady. And now, as of 2017, there it appears that they are doing more PET than SPEC in their practice here, which is kind of a summary of what's happening across the country with the more adoption of cardiac PET in the assessment of myocardial perfusion imaging. And it is clearly more sensitive as they were detecting more disease and having more abnormal studies compared to SPECT imaging in this study. And looking at their data, they looked at outcomes in terms of 16,000 patients who underwent PET from 2010 to 2016, and they followed them up for looking at early revascularization and myocardial uh, uh, all cause and cardiac mortality. And what they found is that at a point of 5% compared to the 10%, the famous 10% from SPEC data, at the point of 5% ischemia, there was a benefit with revascularization with PET compared to the 10% from SPEC. And this is a study that is kind of covering um, uh, a lot of uh, making a lot of changes. But PET is not only about some images. It allows us also to do uh, myocardial blood flow assessment and allows us to come up with coronary flow reserve with dynamic imaging. And this is the patient that I showed you before, which appears that this patient has one vessel disease, but when we look at the myocardial flow reserve, it's actually depressed all over, and he has much larger area of decreased flow and steel phenomena, and this patient has three vessel disease rather than just one vessel disease. And the same group in Kansas City also looked at their patients looking at those who had uh, coronary flow reserve assessment and myocardial blood flow, I followed them up for a med medium follow-up of 3.2 years. And as we know from before, myocardial blood flow reserve, uh, as it goes down, there is increased risk of uh, cardiac events, whether it's all-cause mortality or cardiac events, but also looking at the different subgroups, or whether it is even among patients with 0% ischemia, a decrease in myocardial flow reserve was associated with worse outcome. And that was much worse, the separation of the curves with patients with significant ischemia. So when we look at it, wh which point that you can see that there is benefit from medical therapy versus revascularization, and looking at this point, it looks like at around 1.8, this is where the curves interact. Uh, and you can see here at patients with global myocardial flow reserve, more than two, these patients have uh, the hazard of, uh, uh, there is actually benefit with revascularization compared to the other groups. And now this technique is mature, it's well adopted in practice, and you can see here that now there, is, there are billing codes for it, and now for the first time you can be reimbursed for this, for uh, applying myocardial uh, blood flow assessment,
and that's why the uh, there's significant interest in the community in learning this tool and make sure that we are doing it right and if you look at this it's not only implied in coronary disease it may help also in assessment of non ischemic cardiomyopathies this is a paper that was just published looking at those patients with LVH hypertension and looking at those without coronary disease without myocardial infarction and no ischemia can we link between coronary flow reserve and development of uh, hypertensive heart disease and dilated cardiomyopathy there are multiple mechanisms at the cellular level that make that plausible when we look at this data just published three weeks ago and presented at the ACC that coronary flow reserve may have an impact when the pa there is still adaptive remodeling and there is still concentric LVH where you can see here that there is uh, the drop in myocardial blood flow is associated with worse outcome but once these ventricles dilate and you have eccentric hypertrophy and now this there was at that time it's too late and these patients the myocardial blood flow may not add much at that point Moving on to another uh, application of cardiac PET, which is looking at cardiac sarcoidosis. This is, for example, a patient that was suggested to have cardiac sarcoidosis by MRI. He has multiple areas of uh, delayed enhancement. You also see multiple areas of FTG uptake in the uh, PET. And we are still using often cardiac uh, uh, FTG, fluorodeoxyglucose, for the assessment of these patients. Uh, to identify uh, active cardiac sarcoidosis. However, this technique, to, in order for it to be, um, to be done accurately, the patient has to follow a strict diet and they have to be fasting for 12 hours. Some centers are using heparin. And this is where there is an interest to try to simplify this approach and try to use certain prepar easier preparation methods or even other radio tracers that might be of easier uh, imaging applicability in these patients. And one of these was published last year on these tracers, which is uh, deox uh, deoxy, it's an F18 based agent, uh, fluorothymidine which does not require extensive patient preparation and it's actually deter its uptake is determined by cellular proliferation including sarcoidosis granuloma so now we're imaging the granulomas and these are the images here so, and it looks like compared to FTG it does have a correlate in terms of uptake but the uptake is uh, less intense as you see also in terms of the correlation of R of 0.22. So there is at least good signal here, but there is also widespread correlation in terms of uptake. So we're looking hopefully to try to get into more tracers that will allow us to be more specific in these patients. Uh, looking at also, there is always a question, what are we seeing with cardiac PET? Because we're imaging with FTG, which is relatively nonspecific. Are we sure that we are seeing white blood cells or are we seeing uh, inflammation? So the Brigham group actually did a very nice study looking at those patients that went for heart transplant between 2008 and 2018 and looked at their explanted hearts and they match it with their database of PET or MRI. So among those patients, 18 patients had FTG PET and they eventually went for transplant. And looking at their classification of likely, possible, probable, or highly probable, trying to see what's the accuracy of these classifications in these 18 patients who underwent FTG PET and then had their heart explanted. And it looks like it is very sensitive, but the specificity is low in this selected group. And here's, for example, one patient which has a typical perfusion defect, and you have a significant FTG uptake. There are multiple other areas of uptake of, of cells. This is the explanted heart confirmed by granuloma. When you look at the, this other patient has a perfusion defect there. There is also FTG uptake in that area. There are no other extracardiac uptake, 
And what you see here, this patient was called probable because of perfusion defect and lateral wall uptake. But then the final diagnosis was arrhythmogenic ventricular with fatty infiltration, as you see here. So this fatty infiltration is the one that's causing this perfusion defect, hope probably. And this FTG uptake appeared to be one of those non-specific ones. And they couldn't do much in terms of the MRI for this because they had only among those 31 patients that underwent MRI and had their heart explanted, only one of them turned out to be cardiac sarcoidosis. So there couldn't be done, uh, do a meaningful analysis for that. I want to finish up with amyloidosis. Still, uh, you heard about MRI and advances in MRI. We also, although it's not done by PET, we use ATT, uh, we use PYP imaging, and people now are moving from planar towards spec CT, and this is one case from our lab where you can see apical sparing and you see significant septal uptake and lateral wall uptake. But, and there are now new guidelines that came from ASNIC suggesting uh, how to use these different multi-modality uh, imaging in terms of amyloidosis along with an appropriateness criteria. But I just want to point out that PYP imaging has multiple pitfalls as been demonstrated by multiple studies. And uh, there are some false positives and false negatives that you need to be aware of. And this is one case, for example, published in the literature where the patient has a VAL122I mutation and he has a negative PYP. You think that this patient would have a positive PYP. And this is where PET-CT might be able to come in into the picture and allow for further reanalysis of these. Uh, you can see that he has a positive uh, PY, uh, florbitapir PET-CT which allows for further enhancing the diagnosis. So it looks like also in AL, this one appear have much higher uptake, less with ATTR and no uptake with non-cardiac. So to sum it up, cardiac PET, there have been a significant advances in technology as we move digital. There is expanded use in the community. There's reimbursement for coronary flow reserve measurement, which is in enhancing its use and interest in learning this technology. There is also established role in cardiac sarcoidosis and an emerging role in cardiac amyloidosis. Thank you very much. Great. Wonderful. That was a, a great overview of uh, some of the advancements in the last year. We've got a few minutes now for questions. Uh, do we have any questions from the audience? Sure. Um, and while we're, while we're getting some questions teed up, let me maybe ask uh, both of you here. Uh, Moaz, what, uh, is there a role for uh, PET in assessment of myocarditis, especially now in the current pandemic era that we're in, uh, where you know, we see lot, you know, a lot of these patients with uh, COVID-19 will have troponin elevations. And then the question is, could this be myocarditis? Is this a type 2 MI? Is this uh, a true ACS, is, is so, there any? I mean, in terms of myocarditis, it's a, obviously a broad term. It can yeah. be from infectious causes like in potentially COVID-19, but also could be from other non-infectious causes. <coughs> so sarcoidosis is imaging a form of myocarditis, yeah. obviously, but it's more related to connective tissue disease or other uh, path pathophysiology. Theoretically, it's possible to at least highlight if there is any active inflammation, although I'm not aware of much publications in that field. So it's, yeah. there is not much data in general viral myocarditis. Right, because the lymphocytic. Most of these yeah. patients are self-limited and they are like well imaged with MRI yeah. and uh, kind of don't <laughs> progress significantly. Yeah. But uh, technically, there is significant interest in this, mm -hmm. and uh, especially if you find delayed enhancement in MRI, you don't know how is it active or this happened sometime before, and you need to look for some markers of activity like edema or inflammation by PET. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great. And obviously, CT I think is, has a huge role, uh, certainly for looking at the lung findings. Uh, and also for excluding coronary disease uh, in these patients in a very rapid fashion. 
Uh, anything you know new as far as kind of tissue characterization by CT that you're uh, aware of? Yes, um, the Italian has done a quadruple rule out protocol in, co in with COVID COVID patient. We well, you know that uh, CT could perform um, similar to lay hyper enhancement because iodine has similar distribution as gadolinium as extracellular. But you know the noise uh, signal ratio is, is about two times less than MRI. Mm -hmm. Having said that, with the new development of the um, dual energy CT, uh, and uh, hopefully in the future, near future, for photon counting CT, we can uh, improve the signal ra ratio and it will be very useful in patients with COVID, show up with chest pain. You can look at the coronary, you can look at the lung, and rule out PE, uh, and could potentially could look at. Um, increased extracellular volume in the myocardium. Obviously, there's no uh, histology, histology when we do CT, but uh, that will be uh, mm -hmm. one of the additional uh, findings that you can, you, can, yeah. you can have in the CT, yeah. Great. Do we have some questions from the yeah. audience we can take? So or I think? Uh, so, yeah, if anybody from the audience, please, uh, if you have a question, anybody from Houston Methodist, you can, uh, I think, raise your hand uh, on the app there. Uh, and we'd love to have a question from you. If there's anybody uh, who's watching it via live stream, uh, please uh, text a question or go to pollev.com slash debakey. Uh, we'll be here for another couple of minutes. We'll be glad to take any other questions. Um, any, uh, uh, any other um any other uh, so let's things? ask you now in yeah. terms of MRI in terms of the perfusion uh, sequence and new sequence yes. so uh, have we like what is the data in terms I, I, so I know that there's the outcomes the recent paper from the uh, London group but do we know how well does it correlate with like for example the CFR that we get from PET are the measurements equal? Or yeah no, that's, a, that's a great question I'm not aware of any data that's that's uh, been published that's compared the CT FFR or the PET FFR with uh, the automated measures uh, that we get by CMR so again this is really I think kind of one of these things that's hot off the press uh, uh, I don't think it's certainly been disseminated widespread uh, and so I'm not aware of any direct comparisons uh, between these uh, different modalities. Yep. So I think that's, that's uh, areas, I think, for, for future work, clearly. I just have a philosophical comment because technically you can do CT perfusion and first pass dynamic and also yes. probably could look at <laughs> flow reserve. Question is, do we really need all these technologies and, and should we dedicate our efforts to find out you know, which one yeah. would be most if cost efficient and and it's great for the science purposes, right? Okay. I think it's gonna come down to the patient-centered imaging. Yeah, I mean, you great. have to select yeah. the test that will give you the answer We're using just one test, and you don't need to go through layer testing and absolutely. allow for further testing for these patients. Yeah, no, I think you're absolutely right. And we've got a question here from uh, Eric Yang. Eric. Hi, hi uh, Dr. Shaw. Uh, great talk, everyone. Um, just a quick question about the diffusion tensor imaging. Um, I understand that that's uh, still in your research, but do you see, uh, do you have a time frame as to when we're going to be able to do that for for uh, for HCM patients? Oh, uh, yeah, that's that's a great question. I, I think again, right now, the, the this most of the the sites that have this, there's a few sites that are doing this work. Uh, most of the sequences still require a fair bit of adjustment and tweaking, so it's not even been rolled out by the vendors as a, even a work in progress or beta software yet. Um, so I think it's still going to be some time away, but I think this is kind of a window into what uh, you know will likely be coming in the next few years, I suspect. Great, thank you. Okay, well, I think uh, with that, I want to thank again uh, Suman and Mawaz. I think a great discussion and. Uh, uh, very nice overview of what's uh, happened in the last year, and I think uh, stay tuned as many more things to come. Thank you very much. Yeah.